Okay, Ling341, we're back for another uh, round of fricatives. I hope you're all doing well uh, and are at least in a mood enough to think about phonetics for a little while. So last time we uh, left off um, with this question of, uh, well, we pointed out that fricatives are difficult in general because they require uh, a lot of articulatory precision, um, which you can't handle, say, if you're drunk. Uh, or if you're just learning how to talk. Um, but then we also ended up with this um, observation that, well, I told you, uh, kind of as a postulate, that voiced fricatives are even more difficult than voiceless fricatives. Why is that the case? Uh, well, I'll give you the data, first of all, uh, before I answer the question. So uh, this is from that UPSID database, uh, which looked at 316 different languages. So we have, um, generally speaking, more languages are going to have the voiceless um, counterpart of a fricative at any particular place of articulation. Uh, say at the alveolar uh, at the alveolar place of articulation, which is the most common place of articulation for fricatives, we get 266 languages with S, 96 languages with Z. Um, so that's a ratio of about um, well, one out of three of these uh, every language that has um, a voiceless. Fricative at that place of articulation has a voiced fricative at that place of articulation. Uh, it's about the same ratio for the post alveolars, the next common, um, next most common place of articulation for fricatives. Uh, from there, we move on to labiodentals, to the velars, to the uvulars, uh, and all of these show the same pattern. There are more voiceless fricatives than voiced fricatives. It's only when we get to sort of these um, very front of the mouth. Uh, fricatives uh, like the bilabial fricatives, there's more voiced ones of those, or at least distributionally there's more languages that have that fricative and uh, likewise there's slightly more languages that have the uh, voiced interdental fricative than have the voiceless interdental fricative. Um, you can already see though this is a, a pair of fricatives we have in English but they're not common uh, across the world's languages. There's only 39 um, uh, out of two, 316. There's probably some overlap here too because in English we have both. So I'm not I'm not exactly sure on the specific numbers about how many languages have interdental fricatives um, but they're not common. Uh, these are the most common, the sibilant fricatives uh, like uh, S and Esh, uh, and then after that, um, labia dentals. Uh, there's also some data on even less common fricatives here, which show the similar pattern of what we saw before, where we have more voiceless fricatives for like the retroflex, the palatal, and the pharyngeal fricatives. But these are increasingly less common as we go. So why is that? Why do we get more voiceless fricatives than voiced fricatives? Maybe you already figured this out, uh, but it's an aerodynamic answer. So voice fricatives have to have two sound sources. Uh, they have to produce one sound source at the fricative, like sss, you can hear it nicely uh, at the alveolar ridge and or your teeth for that one. Uh, and then <clears throat> this is like going back to our little demo of how voicing works uh, at the very beginning of the semester. So you say sss, and you can switch it to a Z sound as you go. Sss, sss, and you can feel with your fingertips as you do that the second sound source um, appearing at your glottis when you start to vibrate the vocal fold. So zzz, that's a voiced fricative that has two sound sources. Uh, and you can also kind of clearly hear the one at your alveolar ridge when you're producing even the voicing there. Zzz. The problem is it's not easy, not as easy to produce two sound sources as it is to produce one in a fricative. So in voicing, air rushes through your glottis in short regular bursts because remember our vocal folds are popping open and closed on a very quick and regular basis uh, when we voice things. So part of the time your glottis is actually going to be closed. It's a short amount of time but it's regular, right? It's interrupting that airflow as you go. Uh, and that airflow will be interrupted at the other sound source when you try to produce that voiced fricative. So you don't have a constant stream of air to make the tss part of that um, fricative. It's interrupted zzz, even if you can't hear it. Um, as being interrupted because it goes by so quickly. Um, either way, you're trying to do two things at once rather than one, and one of those things makes the other thing a little more complicated to do. So that is why you are not going to see as many voiced fricatives in the languages of the world, languages of the world, as you are voiceless fricatives. Uh, and we can see what a voiced fricative looks like in a spectrogram. I've shown you one of these before, but it's worthwhile looking at it again. It's also worthwhile looking at um, these sibilant fricatives too. Uh, because they're very distinctive in a spectrogram because they have a lot of energy up here at the higher frequencies. So I'll play these for you first of all. C. And I'll crank up the volume a little bit. C. Maybe Z. C. Z. Okay. <coughs> Hopefully uh, that came through all right. Um, S. S. 
has a lot of energy at high frequencies. That's what makes it sibilant. That's what makes it loud to begin with and very distinctive from other fricatives. Uh, so these are usually pretty easy to pick out in a spectrogram because it has so much energy way up here. You can see the turbulence throughout, but it kind of drops off here down at the bottom. Uh, it's more, um, there's more dark bands or dark randomness up here um, above 5,000 hertz. Now that's another thing I should point out here. Uh, almost every single uh, spectrogram I've shown you so far in this class only goes up to 5,000 hertz on the frequency scale. S um, or Z as well. Um, sibilant fricatives are kind of the one exception to that. They have important energy that we need to look at above 5,000 hertz on the frequency scale. Uh, so I've expanded this one up to 8,000 hertz. You can see it um, if you expand it even higher than that, it goes way up. Uh, but I'm going to just cut it off at 8,000 hertz because it looks relatively normal this way. Uh, then contrast that with um, Z, our voiced friend here, you can still see the high intensity sort of sibilance up here um, at the higher end of the frequency range, but you also see this periodic voicing, these vertical stripes in the um, voiced fricative. And they're easier to see here down at the bottom because there's less energy for the fricative overall. Uh, but that's being superimposed on top of the fricative energy. And like I said, uh, when those vocal folds are closed, it kind of cuts out some of the turbulence as well. Uh, so the turbulence is not quite as consistent as we see for the S. Uh, and then we see the voicing continue on into the vowel here, right? We see these same vertical lines going through. That's when the vocal folds open and close. Uh, we're just not getting the same sort of structure acoustically here um, because we're working with a different kind of sound source and a different kind of filter as we are for vowels. Okay, so uh, I'll just give you some more typological facts and we'll walk through more of the acoustics of fricatives after that. Um, so again, this is from the UPSID database. So there are 21 languages in that database that have no fricatives, um, about 6% of the total. And we'll just walk our way up. There's 37 languages that have one fricative, which is kind of interesting to think about. 62 have two. That's kind of the median or uh, modal number rather uh, for this distribution. After two fricatives it starts going down in terms of the number of languages we see. Uh, English actually has more than eight fricatives um, which is uh, not common in the world's languages so only 22 languages have that amongst this database of 316 that's about six percent of the world's languages. So we have a lot of fricatives we have to worry about um, but that's not so bad right? Uh, although I know a lot of second language learners don't really like the uh, English interdental fricatives. They're not fun, apparently, to uh, pick up if you didn't get them for free. Okay, so another kind of fun fact about this is that of the 21 languages without any fricatives, 15 are Australian. So um, you might remember uh, Australian languages had a lot of stop places of articulation. So for some reason, Australian languages have a lot of stops and not so many fricatives just kind of an accident of history, I guess. Um, Hawaiian is another example of a language without fricatives, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, I'm going to qualify that because if you consider H fricative, I'm pretty sure you can say Hawaii in Hawaiian, so I might have to revise these slides. Uh, so ignore that for now. Uh, like I said, Australian languages uh, have lots of place contrast for stops. They also tend to lack affricates, so that's another kind of unique feature of um, that uh, continent's languages. Um, Kabardian is a language that has uh, the most fricatives that I know of. It has 22. Uh, Kabardian is a Caucasian language um, spoken in the Caucasus Mountains in um, sort of between uh, Russia and Iran. Uh, and uh, Kabardian is an interesting language because uh, it has a lot, a lot of consonants. Um, but for a while, uh, people actually thought Kabardian might not even have any vowels. Uh, and there was some debate like back in the 50s and 60s, like, oh, can we analyze this language as if it has no vowels and just has maybe like a syllable peak that sometimes looks like a vowel. Um, and they kind of debated that for a while and eventually found um, that when mothers, uh, native speaking Kabardian mothers, uh, speak to their children, uh, they actually kind of emphasize the one sort of vowel distinction they have, which is a distinction between like an ah and a schwa. Uh, so it's kind of like a low versus mid vowel. Uh, but um, aside from that, they don't really make that distinction super clear because normally the, there's a lot of co-articulation between the vowels and the consonants in which um, uh, the vowels are the context of the consonants in which it's produced. So if it's like next to a coronal, the vowel might be more like an E or something like that. Or if it's like next to a labial, it might be an OO, something like that. Uh, so Kabardian is kind of a fun language. Uh, again, I'm just passing this along uh, just for kicks. Um, if a language has one fricative, uh, that, that fricative will tend to be S 
like I said, that's the most um, popular uh, choice for fricatives is the alveolars, probably because they're so acoustically distinct. Uh, if a language has two fricatives, uh, it'll probably add on uh, an S to the S or perhaps an F. Uh, those are also both popular options. But usually uh, a language will pick um, the voiceless fricatives again before it starts going to the voiced fricatives because um, fricatives are obstruents. They're just not as easy to voice as sonorant things, so it's easier to stick with the voiceless ones like S, S, or F. Okay, uh, like I said, S and S are known as sibilant fricatives, so they have a lot of acoustic energy at high frequencies, uh, more so than other fricatives. Why is that? Uh, number one, they're obstacle fricatives, kind of obstacle fricatives par excellence. Uh, so they're creating an obstacle out of the back of the upper teeth uh, as they're produced, and that makes them louder than other fricatives because that's such a great obstacle um, to work with uh, as an acoustic generator of sound. Uh, there's also a small and short resonating filter between the constriction and the lips. So um, normally we think of the filter as everything between our vocal folds and the front of our mouth uh, because we're generating a sound source here, say for um, vowels or say an H, like which is a voiceless vowel. But for S, our sound source is way up towards the front of the mouth at the alveolar ridge or at the teeth. And there's not a lot of space in between the teeth and the front of the mouth. Um, so that very short tube uh, is going to be what's resonating. That's going to be the filter you get um, to shape the sound uh, source that you get from the fricative turbulence itself. So that um, filter being so short is going to resonate at a very high frequency. Um, and that's why you get a lot of energy at the higher frequencies and sibilance than you do for other fricatives. Uh, so uh, we've seen some examples of S versus Z. This is what S looks like versus a non-sibilant fricative, F. Psi, phi, psi, phi. And we've all heard these fricatives many times in our life, so uh, we don't have to sort of dwell on, well, dwell on the sound of them too much. Um, but it's easier to kind of pick out uh, what they look like in a spectrogram uh, because of these properties. So the, this is the high intensity, high frequency energy you get for S. Remember, like I said before, it kind of drops off here down at the bottom. For F, you tend to get less energy across the board and it's more or less evenly distributed uh, across all the frequency range, uh, frequencies uh, in the frequency range. Um, so you don't have like a particular um, intense part for uh, F. There might be a little bit more here where it's next um, to the vowel formants as it kind of merges into the vowel. Phi. But basically um, it has what's called a diffuse spectrum. Um, we uh, can also look at Esh versus theta. Shy, phi, shy. Uh, and we see this sibilance again for Esh, um, where it's high intensity at the higher frequencies. And for Theta, it looks a lot like F, actually. So F, 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 F. Um, you might notice, if you pay attention <laughs> um, to just the sound of those fricatives uh, in sort of a very phonetic, raw phonetic way, uh, they sound very similar. Um, and in fact, uh, in, when they do per, uh, speech perception tests of sort of confusability of various consonants in English, F and F tend to be the most confusable consonants just at a raw perceptual level. So F, F um, sound very similar. And they look very similar in a spectrogram as well. Um, th here is kind of losing a fair amount of energy, but it looks kind of like F. Uh, it's weak across the board and it's also kind of evenly distributed across the board more or less although it's kind of dropping off down here at the bottom Shh. also looks like s uh except there's one difference um which is that ash has more energy down here towards the bottom of the frequency range that cutoff between sort of the high intensity frequencies and the low intensity frequencies for ash for sorry for s it's maybe around 3,500 hertz where that's occurring. For Esh, it's occurring at a lot lower frequency, maybe around 2,000 hertz before we get into the weak stuff down here at the bottom. Can you tell me why that is? Why don't you pause for a second and just think about it, and then I'll start up a new video here in a minute.